The Apostle Paul's beginning to say that, but he has to have somebody to take care of him. Now that just brings this up. It's important for you to know that sometimes uh, just saying, I'm going to trust the Lord when He gave you a doctor to go to is just pure foolishness. Now uh, you say, I'm going to trust the Lord, i got a headache. Okay, well, you can say with a head like that it ought to ache, but I trust the Lord if i got a headache. Okay, we'll take an aspirin. Well, I'm just going to trust the Lord. Well, okay, He gave you medicine. So when the Lord gives you certain to be able to utilize, you break your leg and say, I'm going to trust the Lord to heat it. You're going to walk crooked or you're going to die from, you know, gangrene or whatever it might be. Don't get caught up, ladies and gentlemen, in these individuals that try to make something spiritual about it, whether or not you do or don't go to a doctor or a dentist. I know some people right now, their teeth are about to fall out of their head because they won't go to a dentist. Well, God doesn't intend for you to have rotten teeth. Well, you know, Adam and Eve didn't need a dentist. They also had a little different diet than you did and lived in a little better environment. <laughs> Things have gotten progressively worse. Would you agree? You know, ladies and gentlemen, the thing about Christianity today is, is sometimes Bible believers, they use their head for everything, including a hat rack, instead of using it for something besides a hat rack. Think with it. You know, if your car's busted, you go to the mechanic. If the plumbing pipe's busted, you call Robert or you call a plumber. If you want something done as far as your physical body is concerned, you go see a doctor. Do you understand? There's nothing unspiritual about that. You say, why? You still have to trust the Lord to bring you to the right doctor. Now, I'm going to say something, and it'll probably upset some people for me bringing it up in that kind of a deal. I honestly believe that the Lord led us to the right doctors for us. When she was sick a couple of years ago, and it was real serious, and they got our attention, and we recognized that, and there were some people that were telling us, you know, to take this and to do that, to do this and to do that. And we chose to do the conventional thing because of the aggressiveness of the cancer that she had. But we believe that the Lord led us to the right doctors. But then we had to submit to the treatment. And she had to pray that the Lord would help her to get through the treatment. And some of the side effects of that stuff is still around for a long time. Well, you know, if you hadn't have done it, you know, then she wouldn't have the side effects. No, she might not have had the side effects. She might be in the ground. And you wouldn't have to live with that. You'd have to live with me without having her to take care of me. And that might not be a really good thing. So, so here's the Apostle Paul. Uh, if there was anybody spiritual in the, in the Bible for the Pauline epistles, the Apostle Paul is certainly spiritual. You know what he said? Only Luke is with me. Why of all the other apostles, why would it be Luke? Because he needs a doctor. He needs somebody to travel with him, somebody to help him, somebody to give him medicine. All right, the second thing that you want to grab a hold of that thing is, is that he says to take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable uh, to me for the ministry. John Mark is the same guy that nine years prior to this that Paul said, leave him behind, that Barnabas and Paul split over. Nine years later, he's learned his lesson. I'll give this to him. He didn't give up. Notice context now. Demas forsook me, having loved this present world. John Mark got kicked to the side, but he didn't get out. That must mean John Mark might have been immature, and he might have been uh, unintellectual. Un he might not have known some of the things that he should have known uh, that about the Apostle Paul when he first kicked out. But what I like about him is he didn't quit. I mean, he got booted to the curb. He got put on the bench right off the bat. And while we could make a big deal about it, how about make a big deal of this? Nine years later, he's still in the ministry. Now you got, that's, that says a lot. You say, why? Well, I don't know. Somebody pulled up and pulled in his parking place or somebody sat in his pew or he didn't get recognition for something. There's no mention of him at all until nine years later. And Paul said, well, he's profitable. That must mean that during those nine years, he had been doing something that got Paul's attention. You know what gets my attention is that he didn't get out in spite of opposition. Amen. I like that. All of us as Christians could use that. You say, why? The misconception nowadays, the perception is, is because you're dealing with Christians that they're supposed to be something other than human. Well, I hate to tell you, until you're either dead or the rapture happens, you're still going to have a human side to you. And the temptation is going to be that when you don't get your way to get out. So I admire John Mark. I admire the fact that he didn't quit. Yes, he missed out on nine years and Lord only knows what he could have been. But guess what? At least he gets something. And at the tail end of Paul's ministry, you know what he said? Bring him. He's profitable for the ministry. So I want you to pick up on that. Then he sends Titus there to Ephesus and the cloak that left the Troas and Carpus and thou comest bring it with me. 
me uh, with thee. And the books, especially the, pros, uh, the parchments, that's probably New Testament writings there. Now I want to hit this thing on verse number 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Heavenly Father, would you please be with us tonight? Thank you for the good group of folks that are gathered here. Thank you for the privilege of us being able to get together. And we'd ask now your blessings upon what we undertake to do. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, Alexander the coppersmith, come to Acts chapter number 19. It's a silversmith. It's an individual that does something. Remember context. Remember that I taught you that uh, the, uh, when uh, Demas left, having loved this present world, that following after idols creates or calls you, or following after your desires creates or causes you to make an idol. It's interesting, an idol maker shows up in the same passage. You say, what, it's an aid to worship, but are we any less guilty of having our own idols? I mean, I've seen people make idols out of uh, sports. I've seen them make idols out of work. I've seen them make idols out of money. You can pretty much make an idol out of anything. How about this? You ever made an idol out of bitterness? You ever made an idol out of grief? You ever made an idol out of anger? You say, no. How do you know it's an idol preacher? Every time that thing comes up, it trips your trigger just like that. You say, why? Somebody's kicking your God. I can say Elvis Presley to you folks. It doesn't mean nothing to you at all except somebody doing the, you know, the wiggle jiggle or whatever it might be and singing ain't nothing but a hound dog and whatever. But, you know, preacher, he's not such a bad guy. I mean, you know, after all, I mean, you know, he did sing, you know, uh, gospel hymns at nighttime. Yeah, guilty conscience. Well, preacher, you know, you can't, you know, fault a guy. He likes peanut butter, mayonnaise sandwiches, fried and butter at nighttime and, and that kind of a thing. And I mean, but man, I mean, God, preacher, if you hear that guy sing Amazing Grace, I mean, you, you know that guy must be saved. Well, if he is, there he is. But I say Elvis Presley to you. I say Princess Diana to you. I say, uh, I don't know, Madonna to you. I say Michael Jackson to you. Hey, you know all those people. Doesn't mean anything to you in any way, shape, or form. You're thinking, oh, well, I'd never be anything like that. Okay, good. You're not going to make it. So I didn't kick your idol. But how about if I preach on bitterness tonight? Would that, would that trip your trigger a little bit? How about if I preach on grief tonight? How about if I preach on covetousness or enviousness? How about that? How about reputation? Would you feel like I was kicking your Elvis Presley? Kicking whatever it might be? I don't know what your idol is. I know God wouldn't have put it in the Bible. And this is the swan song. This is Paul writing out to Timothy before he's getting ready to go. And this thing about idol worship and this thing about loving the world and not loving God is replete all through that whole passage right there. It continues to show itself through there because Paul's saying, you got to watch it. 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 And we got to watch it. That's the thing that'll get in the way. That's why I admire John Mark. John Mark didn't make a, 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 an idol out of the fact that he got kicked to the curb and he got rebuked. He didn't run around running Paul down. You don't have anything where, you know, yeah, that preacher and what he said to me and that preacher did this and that preacher did that. He ain't perfect. I don't know who he thinks he is and I don't know what. Yeah, he told me this, but I mean, he didn't have any mercy on that guy. Some preacher he is, some pastor he is. I mean, some grace he showed, some mercy to me. I mean, after all, he blinded the guy. Okay, well, you ever mentioned why he blinded the guy? Nobody ever takes the time to figure that one out. Why did he blind the guy? The guy was standing between him and somebody getting saved. The guy standing between him and him doing what God said to do. Do you think he could have asked the, blind, the guy to be blinded if God wasn't behind what he did? Do you ever pause for a minute to recognize Paul didn't have the power in himself to blind anybody? Am I right? So God must have been behind the rebuke. But suppose that rebuke was there to test out John Mark. <laughs> do you ever think about that? You ever think about that? Then when Paul comes through there, he says, no man stood with me. And I said, oh yeah, and by the way, Alexander the coppersmith hath done me much harm. The Lord reward him. John Mark didn't do him any harm. But the Lord reward him unto his works. Look at this thing in Acts chapter number 19, verse number 33, 1933. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, and the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander beckoning with his hand, and he would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what, men, what man is there that knoweth how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image that fell down from Jupiter. 
Now, I don't get into all the stuff that's there, but the Apostle Paul comes along there and he said, this is the gods that have come down from up in Jupiter and they've come down and they think these two prophets are there and they think that because Paul's with his buddy there, they think they've come down from outer space to worship and they want to make idols to them. Take your Bible, if you would, please, and turn over to uh, make it. Uh, stay right there. Stay right there. Look in verse 35. The town court of the people, and he said, Ye men of Ephesus, the man is known, of, uh, excuse me, that knoweth not how the city of Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana, the image which fell down. There's a question mark there. Look in Daniel chapter number 8. Daniel chapter number 8. This guy's an idol maker. I'll make you an idol of whatever you want. You say, what is an idol? It's an aid to worship. You say, yeah, it's an aid to worship. Yeah, it's a little more than an aid to worship, ladies and gentlemen. It's the thing that you worship. What do you make an idol out of? I don't know. You can pretty much make an idol out of anything. You ever made an idol out of your reputation? You say, no, I've never made an idol. Daniel chapter number 8. I've never made an idol out of my uh, reputation. Are you sure about that? You ever been sitting at a restaurant and you walk in first and some other people walk in after you? A bunch of heathens, you know, they walk in and, and they sit down. They come in 15 minutes after you do and the waiter comes out and he's late and they walk up to the table and they stop there at the table and walk right past you and take the other people's order and you were there first. I'm sorry, I didn't say, you didn't say your reputation was ever a god. And not only that, just a bunch of heathens ordering a bunch of liquor and talking and can't make their mind up and can't decide and you already know what you want. You say, what's that? Lord, kicking that idol. They must not know who you are. They must not have set the clock on you when you came in. They must not have given you the number one. They get service first. You ever recognize that stuff? You say, why does that stuff happen? God uh, checking your idols. Sometimes we make an idol of ourself, make an idol of our accomplishments, make an idol when we walk in. The Bible says when a man thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. That's what he says. Now, you may not struggle with that. You may not have a problem with that in any way, shape, or form. You may consider yourself to be perfectly at ease with whatever anybody says about you. But that's uh, for most people, for most people, to be uh, improperly and un, um, dishonestly spoken about we'll find out whether or not you have a, an idol to yourself. You think somebody's taking advantage of you. You think somebody's lying to you. You think somebody is uh, uh, being demeaning towards you. You say, what is all that? The Lord's saying, you sure have made an awful looking uh, image to yourself there. That passage in the book of Romans where he says in Romans 8, 29, he talks about the predestination there of being conformed to his image. And Philippians chapter number 4, he talks about being, having the mind of Christ and let this mind in Philippians 2 be in you that was also in Christ Jesus who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself a little lower and had learned obedience by the things he suffered. You know what God said? Your reputation is no good. Paul said, I'm not worth anything. But that's a tough one. You say, why? You live in a self-esteem uh, era of time. You live in a time where it's all about you. It's all about you. It's what do you want? What do you want? What do you want about you? What about you? Feel good about yourself. Why well, feel good about yourself? You're doing something. You want Bundy to feel good about himself? Well, that's different. Berkowitz, you want him to feel good about himself? Uh, you want the, the guy that killed all the co-eds out there in, uh, what was it, Colorado or whatever? You want him to feel good at the big, tall, six-foot-nine guy? blew his grandparents' brains out and then went to the nut house and then got out of the nut house and then killed six co-eds and then killed his mama and her friend and he's sitting in the prison now. You want him to feel good about himself? That's what the world teaches you. The world teaches you that when a preacher gets up and tells you what the Bible says and said this is God's opinion of you and your opinion of yourself doesn't line up with God's opinion, that there's something wrong with the preacher for telling you that you shouldn't be feeling guilty about being messed up as a soup sandwich. Those days are gone. Even you old people, now I'm an old people now, you remember days when preachers would get up and tell you, this is what the Bible says, and you'd listen to what he said. Nowadays, it's like, well, now I don't know if that's really true. You're watching too much TV. Amen. There's no way that your thoughts are his thoughts. You say, why? Because he says so. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. My ways are far above your ways. When a preacher gets up and he says to you, he said, now this is what the Bible says. You say, well, preacher, you can't grow a church that way. You're supposed to be growing Christians, not grow a church. Amen. 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 
choice to go individuals. That's what you're supposed to do. But it's hard because you have to take a long look. I'm not talking about the silver lined mirror with a piece of glass over it. And you look in there and see what it is you want to see. While you look at that thing every day in the mirror, you've ignored all kind of stuff on that thing. You can't see half of what other people see in you. You think you look in there and say, hey, baby, how you doing? Boy, I'll tell you what, you're ready to go. Somebody said, man, you ugly as a mud fence. What is wrong with you, man? You ugly and your mama dresses you funny, man. I mean, good night alive, man. If you have a face like that, stop an undertaker along the way. What is wrong with you, right? But you look at yourself and thinking, man, I'm looking pretty good, right? Except for that big old tire around your middle. <laughs> it doesn't exist. You say, why? The bottom half of that mirror, you got, you know, Michael Phelps, you know, picture peg taped up there and you look in there and think, yeah, baby, look at that six pack. <laughs> yeah, you got a keg, Bubba. You ain't got no six pack. You say, why? Too many donuts, too much bread and peanut butter. Now, now, why do you say that stuff, preacher? Just to check you. See, some of you are good and jacked up right now. You say, why? Well, I don't know. You must be thinking of yourself. You say, why? People can't take a joke anymore. Everybody's looking to be offended. You say, why? A bunch of self-worshippers going around. You can't talk about anybody. You can't joke around. I understand foolish jesting. I get the whole deal. But there's nothing like being around that stuff and you being in the barrel that day and then picking on you to recognize, you know something, I guess I probably do think a little too much of myself. <laughs> you say, well, this don't sound like Bible preaching to me. Well, sure it is. It's a spot on Bible preaching. You say, why? The Bible teaches you that God's a jealous God and he'll have no other gods above him. Amen. He teaches you if you want to have fellowship with Him, you got to be on a cross. That means you're dead. He don't mean you're just dying on the cross. He means you're in the ground. You ever see what happens to somebody when they lay on the ground for a little while? Yes, sir. They have a tendency to smell. Right. He likens you to a dead man. Right. Do you ever been around dead people? I've been around a few dead people. I've been around some dead people that have been dead for six, seven days. Some of them longer than that. Yeah. You'd be surprised how they smell. You'd be surprised what attaches itself to dead people. That's right. You'd be surprised what stays away from dead people. <laughs> right? You know what he said? You're dead. Why does he liken you to something dead if you're so good? You say, why? Paul said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Amen. That's the Bible. Uh, Daniel chapter number 8. Now I was going to show you the thing about, uh, uh, about the, the, uh, the idol worship, but I'll tell you what I want to do. Just go ahead and come all the way here to Romans chapter number 16. Romans 16. I'm just going to go in a different direction here instead of that high-minded stuff. Uh, suffice it to say that there's going to be an idol that's going to be here according to what the book of Daniel says, and uh, the devil is going to give that idol the ability to speak. Uh, you're going to see what's starting to take place now where you see inanimate objects that are being able to do certain things. You're going to mess around with genetics and they're going to combine the two things together until you have part motorized uh, uh, individual that is an AI and you're going to have a human being. And eventually what they're going to try to do is they're going to try to put a brain inside something that is mechanical and that thing won't have a soul. And you better hope and pray that thing takes place in the tribulation after we're out of here. Amen. You say, why? It's moving in that direction. It's called science. And what they want to do is intermingle you with other things. This is Daniel chapter number 2. You can look it up later. When they mingled their seed, iron is mingled with clay. When they mingled their seed with the seed of men. That's in Daniel 2. Well, now wait a minute. You said iron and clay. Yes. And then he says, their seed. It's demonic. With clay. What is that? Genesis 6, that thing which shall be hath already been. You say, when's it going to happen? After we're gone. Amen. Rapture happens, we get out, but all hell literally is going to break loose and the devil's going to be in charge and things that you can't even possibly imagine right now. Bill Gates can't come up with that stuff. I don't care how devil possessed you think he is with all of his billions and billions of dollars and how much you think that the devil's in control and everything he is. When we get out of here at the rapture, you will never be able to believe what's going to take place here. That Bible says that when the devil shows up, that if the Lord didn't cut his time short, that even the very elect, that's the 144,000 male virgin Jews that have been called out to preach the gospel and those 12 apostles, even the very elect would be deceived. That's how smart he is. You think you're going to mess with him? You're a fool if you want to mess around with the devil. You say, what do you do? You rebuke the devil and all that? I tell the Lord on him. I just tell the Lord on him. I don't mess with him. You say, why? I'm not stupid enough to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. 
Well, preacher, greater is he that in me than he that is in the world. That, that's a statement of fact. That doesn't mean you can whip him. You know what you have to do? You have to learn there are certain things that are better just left alone. I just need to stay away from those things. Look at this thing, if you will, please, in Romans chapter number 16. Now, Paul is uh, being pretty harsh here. You know what he's saying? There's some people you better stay away from. And the issue here becomes doctrinal issues. He said, beware also to Timothy. He said, not just Alexander the coppersmith, but beware also, Timothy. Beware of what, Paul? Romans chapter 16, look at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to what? Which you have learned and do what? Now, is that plain? Now, preacher, I'm, I'm just not real sure about that because, you know, a pair man down in San Antonio and uh, the fellow that's out in uh, Texas and another fellow over here and that and the other, they, you know, they're, they're all so nice with people and this and that and the other. What's Paul tell you? What did he just tell you right there? But, but why? Because they're ugly or because they're black or because they're female or because they're queer? What does he, what does he tell you? Are you reading it? So I'm wrong when I tell you that you're better off to stay away from a charismatic and a Catholic and a church of Christ. So now, preacher, now you're, now you're being a cult. I didn't say you couldn't try to win them to the Lord. Paul said avoid them, not reach them. Paul said when the JW knocks on your door, he didn't say bid them Godspeed and try to tell you know, cake their ears off and show them all the verses in the Bible about the Messiah and Jesus wasn't created and all the things that you know to do. You know what he said? He said avoid them. You say, why? They'll just twist you up and tangle you up. That doesn't sound very Christian, does it? I'm following the Bible. Amen. Why don't you join hands with all those preachers, uh, people, a uh, preacher? Why don't you go downtown? I've gotten the invitations. I know you find that hard to believe. I've gotten the invitations to come down there and sit with the pastoral committee and to sit with the other people, the interfaith council and stuff like that, to counsel the people at the sheriff's office and the mayor's office and to talk to them about trying to straighten this kind of... You say, well, why don't you go down there? How can I tell you to avoid people with wrong doctrine and then I go down and do it? He said, but it'd be good to be good, be good uh, publicity for the church. That's the wrong kind of publicity. I'm not going to sit on a platform with those people that believe in speaking in tongues and believe in worship and Mary and believe baptism saves you and then get up here in the pulpit and tell you all those things will damn your soul to hell, but it's okay that I, I can handle it. Now, do you know why Paul tells you to avoid them? It's not just for your testimony. It's so that you don't wind up getting pulled into it. You want me to tell you how it works? You get to know them. And then you get to alibi them. And then you get to thinking, well, I know what Paul says, but... You know what he just said? He said, divisions and offenses come. Well, what about promise keepers, preachers? I was around for all that promise keeper stuff. When they're fishing people out of this pond that we had spent years trying to get in here and saying there's two damnable things that you're not allowed to talk about. Doctrine and denominations. So when people would say, well, preacher, are you going to get involved? And they're going down. Back then it was the Gator Bowl. And back then it was the uh, Civic Auditorium. Uh, are you going to go down to the Coliseum? Are you going to go down to the Prime Osborne Center? And that kind of a thing? No, nope, not going down there. You don't want your church. We got all the stuff in the mail. You don't want your church to be involved like it's being involved in a Billy Graham crusade. No, sir. Not going. You say, why? Certain people you ought to stay away from. Amen. You say, why? It makes a statement. For me, it's no different there, and some of you are going to be shocked at this. Come to 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Some of you are going to be shocked at what I'm about to say. For me, there's a, it's worse than hanging out with a pedophile or a queer. You say, why? Those two things won't put you in hell. Doctrine will. See how you immediately recoiled to that? That sounds so unkind as a preacher. You know what the Lord said? You better stay away from false teachers. You know what he says in the book of Matthew? In the book of Matthew, the Lord comes up to you. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. And he lays it on, goes about four verses. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And, and then he, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And he keeps on, you know what he says? He says, you make people that follow after you a twofold child of hell. And there is reward for you coming. And it is the lower the lowest hell, the greater damnation. For what? What about Hitler killed all the Jews? What about Stalin killed all the Jews? What about Bloody Mary, preacher? What about the Crusades? What about all that? The Lord says those people teaching false doctrine get the greater damnation. 
and I'm the bad guy for telling you not to do that? Preacher, you're a little edgy. You know, that just, that's just not very sweet. I'm just trying to protect you. You folks, you try, when you raise your kids and stuff like that, and you raise your, especially your daughters, and you tell them there are certain people, stranger danger, and you should teach them that stuff, and certain people that you ought to keep them away from, and that's the correct thing to teach them. But if a preacher gets up and tells you, you better stay away from people that teach false doctrine, well, he's, he's, he's a bad guy. I mean, you know, Christianity means everybody gets together. Where'd you get that? Who taught you that? That's not biblical Christianity. That may be somebody with a PhD, a THD, and an MSRSV or whatever behind their name and all that behind their name. That's somebody that's not in the Bible. I don't care how educated they are. It never was this ecumenical thing. Apostle Paul's constantly warning you, be careful, be careful, be careful. Watch them, watch them, watch them. It's interesting to me how many kids we get in here. We still get to see people saved here. And they get saved here and then all of a sudden out of the woodwork comes a holiness or comes a Pentecostal or comes a charismatic or comes a church of Christ. Well, did you get baptized? You get baptized. You need to be baptized. If you've been baptized, you've got to be baptized. You know, the Bible says in Acts chapter number 230, repent and be baptized. You've got to be baptized. You've got to be baptized. Have you been baptized? You've got to be baptized. Well, then you're not saved. You're not saved. And the people that don't believe in eternal security, oh, that's a damnable Baptist doctrine. Well, it's a Bible doctrine. Amen. And they come up all of a sudden. You didn't care about them when they were going to hell. Now they're saved. Oh, you're in the wrong church. You don't need to be in that church. I mean, that's an isolationist group. That's a group. That's a cultist group. Those people, they, they, don't, they, they believe they're right and everybody else is wrong. No, I believe the Bible's right and everybody else is wrong. You can be an independent Baptist and be wrong too. Look at what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter number 6, if you would, please. Pick it up in verse 1. Let as many servants as are now under the yoke count their masters worthy of all honor. The name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. And His, and his what? Doctrine. doctrine. Verse number 2. They have believing masters. Let not, them despise, let not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful, beloved, partakers of benefit. These things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the what? Look in verse 3, which is according to godliness. He's a nice guy and he just doesn't know any better and it's perfectly okay. How come nobody preaches that? You know what he says about the guy that doesn't teach it? He's proud, knoming nothing, doting about questions and strifes of words, where hath come the envy, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, destitute of truth, supposing gain is godliness from such. He'll tell you to fight them. You know what he said? Get away from them. Take your Bible and back up just a little bit to uh, Galatians chapter number one. Galatians chapter number one. This is a tough one right here. This is, a, this is a tough one. He said, what are you trying to do, preacher? I'm trying to give you some relief. I'm trying to tell you that it's okay to be nice, to be kind, but you don't have to compromise. You sit down at the table and somebody said, well, I just believe, you know, that the way you get to heaven is, is that you, you take the wafer and you drink the juice and you pray to Mary. Okay, thank you. I won't be having lunch with you anymore. Why? You're so spiritual? No, because I'm afraid, you know, you might get me liking you so much that I get to thinking that maybe, uh, maybe you're not such a bad guy and maybe it'll be okay. And then before long, you know what will happen with you? You won't give them the gospel anymore. You say, why? Because they're nice people. We're not talking about them being mean people. We're not talking about serial rapists and killers here, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about people that claim to be Christians but being saved some way other than the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm the devil for telling you that? I'm not telling you about smoking and drinking and cussing and all that kind of stuff. That's kid stuff. Don't you teach your kids not to hang out with people that drink? Well, you mean old parent, you. Shouldn't you let them learn about it? All I'm telling you is, is the same thing you tell your kid about drinking, I'm telling you about when it comes to false doctrine. That's why I tell you you ought to be careful what preachers you listen to. You say, why? You get to liking them. They're nice. You get a little help from them, you know. You ever uh, press Joyce Myers on uh, eternal security? No, I don't guess you did. You like her, though, because she teaches you basically uh, restructured Freud and Jung. She uses the Bible to interweave uh, interweave her uh, psychological theology. You have to have that classes to be able to recognize it, but you don't have to listen to it five minutes. You can tell you exactly. You say, what well, that, that whole thing is surrounding you. You, 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 you. Some of you women are counting the carpet weaves. It's not time to pray yet. Just hang on. <laughs> but, 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 but she's nice. But she's not hurting anybody. Well, she says she believes in the blood of Jesus Christ. 
You ever ask her about eternal security? Do you know what she believes? Have you ever asked her? Have you ever looked it up? You better be living a holy, godly, clean, pristine life as evidence that you're saved. She wouldn't dare say that. You say, well, why? Well, she wouldn't say she believes in eternal security. That'd be like Jimmy Swaggart saying he believes in it. But he must have believed in it. You say, why? When he messed up, he didn't lose his salvation. That's, right. yeah, that's, right. yeah. that's interesting to me. That's interesting to me. I've heard him say the damnable Baptist doctrine of eternal security. Okay, Jimmy, why don't you get resaved after you messed up with the prostitute? I'm just trying to help you, ladies and gentlemen. I, I wish I didn't have to say this. My contemporaries are not just a bunch of policemen from years ago. Now my contemporaries are preachers. And I hate to tell you this, they lie. That's what the Lord warns you about. So he gave you a Bible so you could learn doctrine to know, that ain't right. That ain't right. Amen. I may not know what it is exactly, but I know it ain't that. That's right. uh, Galatians chapter 1, tough one right here, real tough one. Now let me ask you this question before you get in the passage there and you out me here. Let me ask you this question. How many of you believe that salvation is by grace through faith? Okay. How many of you believe it's because of the blood atonement of Jesus Christ? Do you believe that there's any other way in this age to be saved? One way, right? Well, you bunch of narrow-minded bigots, you. You're so narrow-minded, man, a fly skeeter could land on your nose and kick you with one leg and both eyes. How dare you could believe there's only one way? Well, why do you believe that? Because it's what the Bible says. It's not because of what the Baptists say. Now watch. Here's the Apostle Paul, verse number uh, 7. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Come on, Paul, that's a pretty strong word. Paul said, no, there's people trying to pervert the gospel. And if they preach anything other than what I preach, Paul, you, you're going to tell me you are right and everybody else is wrong? Paul said, yep. 1 Corinthians 15, how that Christ died for your sins according to Scripture, was buried, raised again the third day according to Scripture. That's your gospel. Is that right? Amen. Okay. You know what Paul said? The guy that teaches you baptism is for salvation. Paul just said, let him be accursed. He said, even if an angel said for you to do that, let him be cursed. Now, if he says that, why do you believe that it's okay to sit and entertain a Jehovah's Witness or a Seventh-day Adventist? Because it's your grandma or your auntie? Paul says it's another gospel. Paul said, let him be cursed. Let him go to hell. That's what he's saying. But then he repeats it. <laughs> As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel than that, uh, than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, that's pretty strong language. Come to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3. Preacher, what are you trying to tell me? Just old-fashioned, uh, there's, there's separation, not just from people that smoke and drink and cuss and chew. You should be on a whole other level than that. You shouldn't be running with those people anyway. Any good person from back what I used to do, good people didn't run with those people anyway, whether they were saved or not. Some of you young folks don't realize there was a time in this country where even unsaved men and women didn't hang out with them kind of people. I mean, i got to say this to you. They may have been wicked as the devil, but they kept it in the closet. And there might have been homosexuality around, but they didn't make it public. And there might have been divorce around, but they weren't proud of it. They didn't make it public. And there might have been adultery around, but they didn't make it. It wasn't in the news tabloids. It wasn't all over the newspaper. It wasn't all over social media. There was a time when people kept their mouth shut. There was just things you didn't talk about. Nowadays, everybody is because of social media. Everybody's business is everybody's business. And so as a result of that, everybody thinks, well, this is okay and that's okay. Just because you say it's okay and you've got accustomed to it, like the frog in the bowl of water, it don't mean it's okay with God. Don't ever take God's long suffering as a condonement for you doing something. Well, God's not doing nothing about it. He ain't done yet. Amen. So, well, it'll be over, you know, whenever the fat lady sings. It'll be over when God says it's over. 
And until then, thank God for His mercy and His grace and His long suffering. But your responsibility, your responsibility is, I got to stay away from people that are doctrinally incorrect. You say, why? You older people need to listen to me. Younger people are watching you. And if you sign on to that, what you do in moderation, they will do in excess. Well, I can handle it. I, you know, I'll, I'll take the chicken and throw out the bones. It won't be long, boy, before you'll be eating bones and, and everything. You say, why? You get accustomed to it, and then the next thing you know, your ears get dull, your eyes get dull, and before long, your relationship with the Lord is just as cold as a cucumber. You don't listen to those old-fashioned, old-timey preachers that are always calling you into account for what you're doing. You listen to those preachers that are always talking about the end of the world and talking about some kind of prophetic event or talking about the presidency or some political thing going on or some kind of conspiracy that's happening or the stinking earth is flat or aliens are coming to visit us from outer space and stuff like that. You know why you like that stuff? There ain't no conviction in that whatsoever. You just well go to college and sit in a, a, a college class and listen to economics or something. That's why you listen to that stuff. It makes you feel good. I'm, I'm smart. I'm learning that the earth is flat. You're an idiot. Yeah. Preacher called me up, you know, and read me up one side and down the other because I made a statement pretty dogmatic. I must have been in a bad mood or something, and I said something like that. You're an idiot if you believe that. And he called me up, and I deserved it, I guess. He let me have it. And I said, okay, 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 okay. The earth's flat. You win. The earth's flat. He goes, you don't believe that. I said, no, no, there's flat. We're good, man. We're, we're, we're good. We're there. No, no. I, I went and said, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm 100% with you. Uh, it, the earth's flat. And I said, and now that the earth is flat, what did that do for your relationship between you and the Lord? I said, brother, you are spending so much time trying to prove that the earth is flat. You haven't been on your face before God to find out whether or not your own heart is flat. That's what you feed your people every week. You got all these diagrams, you got all these boards, you got all this conspiratorial theory, a worldwide conspiracy that the earth's flat. Okay, it's flat. I've never been outside the universe. I don't know if it is or ain't. It looks like in the Bible it's round, but you want to believe it's flat? Okay. Spend your time with that. You say, what'll happen? Your relationship with Jesus Christ will be gone. The Lord's up there saying, why would you, you know, I get that passage. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh when your calamity comes upon you. And you're calling out the Lord. The Lord said, go see me or Mr. Flat Earth about that and let him help you out with it. Yeah. Well, I set the camera this way and I know the horizon and the way you got it is because of the fish eye on the camera and this and that and the other. And, and, okay. What, what does that even mean? But you see, some of you are like, well, now, preacher, you know, I don't, that's, that's interesting stuff. Well, I guess it's better than watching porn at night. It's funny how you entertain yourself. The devil won't get you by watching that other stuff. He'll get you by making you watch something that's good and it's clean and it's wholesome, but it ain't God. That's right. And before long, you're divided. I don't mean to shock you. I'm in, I'm in rare, uncharted waters tonight. Y'all are, <laughs> you say, what are we talking about? Doctrinal separation. Amen. You know why we have Baptists on the sign out there? So if somebody comes in here and says, Asha, Lashon, Tai, Untai, a bow tie, economy, Honda, we say, hey, we don't do that here. There's plenty of Baptist churches that do. But since you did, I got the gift of interpretation, and you agreed to pay for the building. <laughs> you say you wouldn't do that. Stand up and speak in tongues, and we'll see. You don't know what you're saying anyway. <laughs> You know why I put that out? It, it, it kind of sets a tone. Yeah. Oh, they're, 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 <laughs> they're Baptist. Yeah, sir. yeah, I don't just put Bible believer church. Right. Amen. You say, why? Amen. You say, all Baptists, right? No, but it sets a tone, doesn't Amen. it? Amen. Amen. It kind of says something. They walk in here, they see red carpet and red pews. Pews. That's right. Pews, right. not chairs. You say, why? This ain't a theater, it's Amen. a church. Amen. They walk in here, they see a King James Bible in the center, the main point, and on either side of it, you have a hymn book. H-Y-M-N, with five or six hundred hymns in it. You say, why? This ain't no charismatic outfit where you're going to have smoke coming out here and electric guitars and... Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven. This ain't no dance club. You ain't going to get no lights bouncing off the walls here. You might get a preacher bouncing off the wall every now and then. But you say, what? Well, it's church. Amen. It's saying, you know, well, this ain't your grandma's. It is your grandma's. 
It most certainly is. We ain't modern. Right. Ain't ain't a word. You need to go look up the new Webster's. It is a word. Second Thessalonians chapter number 3. Don't feel bad about that. Verse number 6, the Bible says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you do what? Come on now, are you with me? Verse three, verse 6, that you do what? From every bird that walketh disorderly, and not after the traditions which you have received of us. You know what he's fixing to show you? Look, if you will, please, in the verse number, oh, we'll pick it up in 10. Verse 9, there's a tough one. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, we commanded you that if any would not work, Preacher, don't you think you ought to be giving out all the money that's coming in and taking care of all the poor? I'm, I'm sorry, what does he say right there? Amen. Look at verse 11. We hear that there are some that walk among you disorderly, working not at all. Why are they disorderly? Because they ain't working. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you ain't working? You're playing around on social media. Yep. You say, what is that? Busy bodies. Yep. It's right in the passage. Amen. Just put Facebook right there by that. Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. Old people. You know what they say right now? They say right now the number one abuser of uh, video games is a white male in his 40s who has at least three kids, two to three kids at home and is making uh, uh, big money. Did you know that? Ain't that weird? Look, if you will, please, the Bible says this. He said, now we command them, there, verse number 12, exhort you by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they... Work. They do what? Work. Work and eat their own bread. Preacher, now, now wait a minute. No, I'm, go ahead and get your governmental program. James chapter number 4. And preacher, you know, some people... I didn't say people didn't need help. Don't you go out here and say, I did. You know what he said? If you're capable of working, you ought to be working. Well, I ain't working because I got a college education and I'm not going to work unless they pay me $25 an hour. Okay, so you're going to go get uh, food stamps and governmental assistance? Well, you're making less an hour getting that than you are if you went to work and flipping burgers at McDonald's. I'm just going by the Bible. If you don't work, you don't eat. I'm not talking about people that have been out because they're sick and people that are disabled and that kind of... I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people that have the ability to work. You live in a governmental society now in the United States of America that pays you to stay home. Even since March of last year, but long before that, pays you to stay home. Stay home, here's a supplement. Stay home, here's the check. Used to, in the early days, that was only people, you know, that were taking advantage of the governmental programs. Now it's everybody. Well, why should you work if they don't? Because the Bible says to. Because the Bible says you ought to work. That's why. I don't work because I, I, I've got to work, you know, to stay off of food stamps. I work because the Bible tells me that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm not supposed to be lazy. I'm supposed to work. You say what? I don't know if nothing else work with a, I can't call it a Chinese drag line anymore. I have to call it a shovel. Do you all even know what that is? A shovel? A rake. You know what that is? Brother Ernie knows what that is. Do you know what a hoe is? Don't answer that. I know what you're thinking. Eighth and Main. No, no, no. I'm talking about the kind you scratch the ground with and you mix concrete with. Why would you think that? I know what you're thinking. I know exactly what you're thinking. You say, Preacher, you shouldn't be saying that. You mean I'm saying what you're thinking? Yep. My dad pulled a dirty trick on me one time. He gave me a hall. I got, got the privilege of working with him by me, Mr. Teams. And we go out there with Mr. Teams. He was a Sunday school teacher. And he said, you're going to mix concrete for Mr. Teams. And I thought that was pretty good because I'd see how they'd cut that, you know, concrete in and put it in the sack of mud and throw in the sand and stuff and pour the water and, and cut that stuff. I thought, yeah, man, I can do that. I didn't have enough sense to know. He handed me a hoe without any of them holes in either side of it. You mix about the second or third load of that concrete, buddy, and you are sucking air and your hands are screaming bloody murder. And, you know, you're thinking to yourself, what's going on? I didn't realize he handed me a hoe, made me work twice as hard. 
those guys are cutting that stuff in, man, and pulling. But they had concrete hose that have holes in the middle of it where the concrete goes through, and it's just a matter of mixing. You say, why would your dad do it? teach you in a work ethic? Yeah. Setting creosote poles. Getting creosote on me. My Paul Paul hooked me up. You don't find that hard to believe. He made me be the mule after my after the mule died and had me out there pulling a plow. I couldn't have been more than eight or nine years of age. I couldn't go fishing if I didn't pull the plow. I was his donkey. Y'all got another name for it, but I would not stoop so low. <laughs> I was his donkey. And he'd hit me with that sun hat, man, and knock the tail. man, I, and he'd call it a different name and smack me upside the head with that sun hat. Get off my beans, he'd say. And I'm looking down there and I'm thinking, them beans ain't, how do they beans? You know, of course, we put them in the ground yesterday. You say, what was that? Your dad let you do that? Yeah, he let me do that. You say, what, well, work ethic? Paul said, you better learn to work. It won't hurt you. won't kill you. Nowadays, kids. You know, you, mama makes your bed up. I'm shuddering right now. My dad's been dead for years, and I'm thinking he's fixing to come back around. Even the thought of not making the bed up in the morning. You, you come out of that room without that bed made, unless you had to run to the bathroom and back. You come out without that bed made. You had something to greet you there. You don't get to pull up to the breakfast table and eat. I don't care if it's Pop-Tarts and Instaquick or whatever it might be. You don't get nothing on that table till you've got that taken care of. Some of y'all are shocked. You know, Mama makes the bed for me. <laughs> yeah, not me. And clothes went in the dirty clothes hamper. Not all over the floor. And if I had ever dared to even think about locking the door on my bedroom, my dad's number 12 would have took it off the hinges. No, he wouldn't have gone and got a screwdriver and tapped out the hinge. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. I would have heard the crash. Some cataclysmic thing would have taken place. That door would have come off like a stick of, of C4 had it and blew it through the window and stuff like that. And this big old giant of a man would be standing there. Who do you think owns this house, boy? He called me boy. He called me boy till the day he died. How dare him? You say, what is he teaching me? Man, he taught me a lot about work ethic. And we work out there sometimes on them cars in the cold and bust your knuckles and stuff like that and get the gojo and get your stuff cleaned up and get your hands cleaned up and stuff like that. Wash your hands. And then the next morning, the clock go off. Time to go to school. Get up, boy. Daddy, I was up late last night and all that. You don't get to work on the car and not go to school. Get up and go to school. Daddy, I don't feel like practice today. Then quit. But if you're going to play, you're going to practice whether you're tired or not. You say, well, that, that's just abuse. That's why the nation's in the stage then now. They let the kids and the women take care of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Good preaching. <laughs> Paul said, you don't work, you don't eat. Amen. You don't work, you don't eat. You're violating a scriptural principle. Yeah. If somebody is able-bodied, they should be working. I don't like Hitler. I don't like Hitler at all. I wouldn't even do him the justice of doing a salute to him. I don't like him at all. But you know what he did? Hitler put him to work. And he said, if you're going to live off the state, you're going to work. That's how he built the Audubon. You ought to study it sometime. He's a wicked as the day is long. But you know what he said? No freeloaders. Arbiting. Work. Look, if you will, please, in James, if you're there already. We're having a good time tonight, I think. Amen. James chapter number 4. Look in verse number 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know that know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Didn't say you were lost. He said you're God's enemy because you're choosing His enemy. You know what he says in Romans 12? I'll see if I can remember it. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your body a living sacrifice, your flesh, your body, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And, and, and. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know that which is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I can't think like the world thinks. 
I got to think like God thinks. It doesn't matter if at the end I wind up on the bottom of the barrel. If I did what God told me to do and get my head cut off for it, my reward is later on in eternity. It's not if I do what God says like Gothard taught. You do what God says even if you're not saved. You're bound to get the, the gold ring at the end of the thing. Uh-uh. Uh-uh, it don't work that way. I don't care how many times that guy said, the biblical principles will apply whether you're saved or not, and it doesn't matter what denomination. That was one of the biggest ecumenical movements that swept, thinking if you raise your kid this way, that kid's going to turn out that way. You can't guarantee that with anybody. You can raise them in church, you can preach to them, you can teach them, they can quote scripture, they can go to youth camp, they can get saved at an early age, but when that kid makes a decision to go contrary to God's will for his life, Life, no matter how good mom and daddy or grandma and grandpa was, you can't control that. You ain't God. Even God doesn't control that. They still have a free will. Do the best you can, and then after that, you've got to turn them over to God. And some of them turn out really, really good, and some of them turn out really, really bad. And some of them in the family, there'll be one good and there'll be four bad. <laughs> there'll be four good and there'll be one bad. You can't ever tell it. You can't call it. There's prodigals in every bunch. All right, take your Bible, if you will, please. Let me just give you a couple more. Come to uh, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. I'm trying to hurry. It's almost 8 o'clock. It's a biblical principle. The world is trying its best to teach you that Christianity is adulterated. Now, you have to study church history to get where I'm headed with this, but where you came up with all the stuff with Christmas and with all the stuff and all that was a combination of mixture of all of the pagan rituals and things in the Old Testament. So you come up with Catholicism, you come up with Constantinople, you come up with Constantine, you come up with the joining of pagan worship and real worship together, and before long you have this conglomeration or this mixture. In the tribulation period, he tells the woman that she's connected there with what's called the whore of Babylon. And he threatens them and talks about being in bed with Jezebel. What he's talking about is an ecumenical movement of everybody together in the same pool. The Lord said, Come out from among them in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, and be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing. For what fellowship hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with a belial? Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing. For you cannot partake of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. That's what he says. Look it up. It's in 1 Corinthians. You know what he's saying? If you're going to follow God, you can't follow the world. You can't ride the fence all your life. But nowadays, some of you have been raised in churches that they just throw it open to everybody and whatever, whatever goes, goes. And throw the mud on the wall, whatever sticks, stick. That's not biblical Christianity. You ought to be able to tell by now, if you've been here for any amount of time at all, you ought to be able to turn on that radio. You ought to be able to listen five minutes to a preacher and tell whether or not he's in line with the Bible. I don't care what his style is. I don't care what his delivery is. You ought to be able to tell if he's in the book or not. If he's not in the book, he's giving you opinion. Dangerous stuff. Dangerous stuff. You say, why? He's not just giving you his opinion. He's giving you all the people that have taught him's opinion, and then he gives you the opinion. That's what a theologian is. They're not a biblical theologian. They're parroting what they were taught in school. Well, I believe in school. I've been to several of them. I think it's important to go to school. But you better make sure that whoever's teaching you is lining up with the book. That's why you all have one in your lap. You say, why? You can find out if I'm lying to you. Yeah. Well, preacher, you know, you can take the Bible out of context and make it say anything you want. Yeah, you're 100% right, and that's on you. If the Bible's right, you have the ability with the discernment of the Holy Spirit to tell whether or not I'm leading you down the primrose path or not. Look, if you will, please, in 1 John, <laughs> excuse me, 1 John chapter number 2, pick it up in verse number uh, 15. This is a tough one. Love not the world. Isn't that what we talked about with Demas? Alexander the coppersmith making up idols. Love not the world. Is the world your idol? Well, no, it really isn't, preacher. Then why you spend so much time trying to be like it? You know, be modern and up to date. Love not the world, he says, talking about affections. Neither the things that are in the world, if a man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. The lust of the flesh, your passions, I gave you this the other day. That's the doing of things. It's what drives you. The lust of the eyes, that's your possessions. That's the having or the holding on to of things. The pride of life, that's your position, that's your being. Now, 
I gave you biblical things that the Lord said, you got to beware, Timothy. you got to watch it, Timothy. Not everybody that talks about Christianity is a Christian. And old preachers used to say, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. That's what they used to say. They used to tell you that. I can tell you right now that you may get out of fellowship with the Lord, and if you do, you're capable of doing anything. But if there's a time you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if the Bible's right, nobody can tell you you're not going to heaven. You say, why? They might catch you at a particular snapshot of your life where things aren't not going so well and stuff's coming out of your mouth and you're doing and saying things you shouldn't do because pressure's on you. Doesn't mean you're lost. It means you're out of control. No person can sit in judgment over you and say, well, I don't believe you'd do that if you're lost. I, listen, if Galatians 5 is right, I'm capable of doing anything that I could do before I got saved except go to hell. But see, there's people that don't believe that. You say, well, that's false doctrine. You know what it does? It puts you on pressure to try to be perfect, and you know you can't. You know what they think they are? They think they're perfect. If you just live like I live, you, I, I know I'm saved. Why? Because look how I live. <laughs> how about how you think? How about we crack that skull of yours and let your thoughts pour out, and let's find out how pure you really are. Amen. Like the big old ego that's making you think you're better than everybody else because you don't light up a cigarette or suck some suds because you're not a drug addict. And you ain't tatted up. You don't have jewelry hanging off of you. Don't have gauges. Right? Don't listen to rock and roll. Occasional country western, he's listening, you know, some little rap song there and there. But, but you know, not rock and roll. Not, not that stuff. No, no. Don't listen to contemporary and go to the right church and all that. You stay away from that book. And you stay away from church. Just a little while, you'd be surprised what you're capable of doing and what you're capable of saying and what you're capable of being, but it don't mean you're lost. Now, I'll try my best to give you some things here tonight to make you think Paul's coming to the end of his life and in the last thing before he gets his head cut off in context, he's given Timothy instruction about this stuff. Now, think about it. You're fixing to die, and he knows he's fixing to die. Would you say that must be pretty important stuff? Amen. Of all the things he could say, Timothy preached the gospel. You know, he says, preach the word, be instant, instant, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering. For the time will come when they'll not endure sound. The context of that next chapter, all that whole thing is based upon that statement. Sound, they won't endure sound. Preach doctrine, preach doctrine, preach doctrine, preach doctrine, preach doctrine. Preach doctrine. You say, why? There's the parameters. That's the foundation. House is only as good as the foundation. Hope it helps you. Let's stand together. We'll be dismissed.